So, hi everyone. Um, today I'm not that super duper happy like I used to be because if anybody read or listened to my video where I say those things to come and those things that are slapped in the face, this video is one of them. This one is going to be a very hard, very harsh truth pill to swallow. And I'm going to tell you all because you're all going to be sitting there and going, what? Anyway, but I've had this information for a while. Didn't really have maybe the courage to come up and say it. But recently, very recently, I have was invited to meet with the Federal Minister on Women's Affairs. Now, I was so honored and I'm still a little bit overwhelmed with the fact that I was actually invited. Um, I happened to be sitting next to the mayor of our city. And I mean, there wasn't that many people there. Right? There were 30 people and I was one of them. And yes, I'm, I'm very happy and thankful. Thank you so much for the person who invited me and brought me along. I, I really do want to give that information and help people with that. And I do believe that some of the information that I am about to show you here, which is all true, is going to completely shock some of the people that were in attendance at that meeting. And what gave me the courage for today, well, I got this necklace. So the company that I am an ambassador for, all right, this is also where I got this cute little t-shirt. I love this message, all right? No place for homophobia, fascism, sexism, you know, racism, hate. I love this t-shirt, right? I, I love the message it has. I usually have my little necklace with the XOXO because the company is called XOXO Fifth Avenue. Um, but I did get this one here. So, and yes, I get discount because I'm an ambassador. If you're interested in anything they have to sell, there is a link below to their site. You also can have a code where you get 10% off, free shipping. I'm done babbling about that part, but to me, this represents a heartbeat. And I was having a really low day this morning and Canada Post has a strike. It's a rolling strike. I'm not mad about that one bit. So when you're actually going to get items in the mail from Canada Post these days is never really sure. And I'm just gonna say the universe is speaking to me because this came in today. I didn't know when it was gonna come in, but it did come in. Um, and it is 18 karat rose gold, so I'm pretty happy on that, but it has a little heartbeat and a little floating little heart there. And I bought this, I, I chose it when I was, you know, very happy when things are going well. And this morning wasn't a good morning, but when I was doing well, I thought I should buy this to remind myself that you know, as long as I have a heartbeat, I have the strength to keep fighting. So that's why I have the little bit of energy that I am going to go here. Because what I'm going to talk about is welfare in Canada. And I have the backup stuff for it. And it's, I'm telling you now, it's not pretty. But so, and I'm only going to be, because there's those statistics about, you know, every province in Canada. But I'm only going to be focusing between a single employable person on social assistance, which means that is a single person who can work and doesn't for whatever reason. We're not here to judge what those reasons are. The reason may be that they don't want to. The reason may be that they can't find a job. The reason may be that they should be on visibility and just don't know how to navigate the system. We're not here to talk about the disability and the F-ups in that part of the system. I've already made a video on that way back in the beginning. I am going to redo it though, now that I'm a little bit better at explaining things, a little bit calmer, um, but it still comes up to the fact that it's a little effed. Straight up. Um, but yeah, so we're just gonna, you know, compare two things. A single employable person, so technically a person who could work and is not for whatever reason that is on social assistance versus a single person on disability in New Brunswick. We're just focusing on New Brunswick 
And I happen to be a single person on disability in New Brunswick, so that's why I'm picking those two. And here we go. This part is going to act more like a voiceover part. It's just that, well, I am poor and I'm working with 10, 12 year old equipment and doing the best I can with what I got. Now, Matry is a marketing research firm that does nothing but statistics. So they do. That's their job. That's all they do. And this one happens to be where they do the statistics for welfare in Canada. So I will link each and every document. So there's, there's going to be two documents that are going to be linked below. Uh, but the pictures themselves of each things that I show here will also be in the comment section of the Facebook No Holds Barred page where I post, you know, this video is up. So, yes, my YouTube is kind of a place to hold my videos. My Facebook page is where the discussion happens. So every single picture that you will be seeing here will be in the comment section uh, where I bring up this video in the No Holds Barred. And they do go up at the same time. So, quickly to talk about what Matry is and they explain what welfare in Canada so the Welfare in Canada reports a look at the total income available for those relying on social assistance, often called welfare, taking into account tax credits and other benefits along with social assistance itself. The report looks at four different household types for each province and territory. Now in our case, again, and in my case, we are going to look at the difference between a single employable person on social assistance versus a single person on disability in New Brunswick. So this is a scale and it's total welfare income, single employable person and the total income for person with a disability in New Brunswick and constant $2,016 because this was made in 2016 and it goes over a span of 10 years. So from 1989 to 2016, okay, maybe that might not be, I don't know how many years that is, don't think about it. But which one of these two graphs do you think is disability and which one do you think is employable person as in person who can't work? This is disability. People who are on disability since 1986 are getting lower and lower and lower income. But people who are employable, who work for a reason, who don't work for whatever reason or another, actually have higher income over the years, because this is 1986, this goes all the way to 2016. So again, for all of you out there who tell me that I'm on disability for the free ride, ah, heck no, because if I wanted to have a free ride, I'd just be on normal social assistance. They obviously make more money than I do. So the next one that we have here is the exact same graph that we just saw, but with the actual dollar amounts. Again, this will be linked below. So now we move on here to table three. So again, the entire document of this is linked below. So you can look at the entire thing if you choose to do so. And there's explanation then those graphs and explanations and graphs. But I only have the pictures of the graphs because I will give you the explanation. This is the comparison of 2016 welfare incomes with 2016 after tax low income cutoff. So in a nutshell, We'll get to it in the end. So we have a single employable person. Their total welfare income for 2016 was 6960 Person with disability total income was 9684 And their 2000 low income cutoff amount is the exact same thing at 17485 for both. If you look at the poverty gap, a single, you know, employable person is in the 10,000 range. They are further into the poverty gap than a disability person. But then if you look at their percentage of their income as per their low income cutoff, a single employable person has 39.9% of their income considered into the low income cutoff. And a person with disabilities has 55.4%. So that means that when I file my taxes as a single disabled person, they take in consideration 55.4% of my income. So this is where I'd like to say something. 
to the person this past weekend who like to make a really big deal because a lot of people again people just don't like me that's fine it's okay but the person that was trying to tell me that my taxes don't count because I don't pay taxes because I'm on welfare well one I am not on welfare I am on disability that's a totally different thing we're gonna address that later secondly social assistance or disability is a taxable income I pay taxes that means that all this is taxable income I have to pay taxes on it and this last graph that we looked at says that people who are on regular social assistance so the ones that you do call welfare bums some of them aren't some of them are but you still classify them all as that when they go do their taxes the tax people look at 39.9 percent of their total income as taxable income or for the low income cutoff limit for the special tax bracket thing but for me or anybody else who is a single person on disability they look at 55.4 percent of my income so here we are at table four which is a comparison of the 2016 welfare incomes with market basket measure so the market basket measure sounds like what we think it is it talks about how we can afford food and their idea of what your market basket measure should be are both the same for a single employable person or a person with disability at 18,668. So if you look here at the person, the green line, single employable person, the percentage of their money that they make of their income that goes towards food is 37.3%. As per a person on disability, 51 0.9% of our total income goes towards food. Half of our money is going towards feeding ourselves. And that is for the people who don't have a special diet criteria. Personally, I happen to have one. I think you've all heard about that. So do people who have celiac disease. So do people who are in chemotherapy. Those all fall under the exact same supplement that I get which is an extra $40 a month. Do you know how $40 can do something? It doesn't help anything. $40 does not help much when a gluten-free loaf of bread is about eight to nine dollars. The next table we have here is a continued part of another one, but that's just because, again, I only picked, you know, Prince of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Quebec in, in the picture that I took. Welfare incomes as of a percentage of after-tax average income for a single employable person is 24.9%, and for a person with disability, it's 34.6%. That one, I don't find it to be that huge of a difference when you think about the fact that a single person with disability makes $3,000 more per year. So this one, I mean, it's not inaccurate. It's not not accurate. I'm just simply saying that this study isn't biased because some of the information isn't necessarily all leaning towards the point that I'm trying to say. So then we move into appendixes. So this is the 2016 welfare incomes by household and component. And, I mean, that has all different kinds of things. So, we are going to scroll down to New Brunswick again. And this just explains why a person who is a single employable person on social assistance gets about $3,000 less than I do as someone on permanent disability. What is permanent disability? So, we'll get back to this one in a minute. So, for me to find out what the heck permanent disability was, you have to to look at the Family Income Security Act. And being the nerd and the geek that I am, I actually have this PDF saved. So I originally found the link to this, again, on the GNB itself page where they were talking about, you know, what the family security incomes are, how much money should be allocated to people on disability, all that whatnot. It was written down in the bottom that they had all their information from the actual acts. 
So this is what we're looking at. Again, if you have a hard time finding these acts, I have them saved. If you want to have a copy of them and you can't find them, let me know. I will gladly email them to you. So again, this is the Regulation 95-6 under the Family Income Securities Act. So the act is a lot bigger than this, but they've taken parts out, which are the parts that are relevant to what we're talking about. So this is just to let you know that it was filed May 1st, 1995. Every once in a while, you'll find something that says been redacted in the date. That means they took it away. But for the most part, things have stayed unchanged since May 1st, 1995. So to continue having your eligibility, however, you know, either a person on social assistance or someone that's like me on permanent disability but gets the top off um, with social development here in New Brunswick because my CPPD is not equal to the amount of what they say the amount is here. And by the way, the amount of permanent disability income in New Brunswick is capped at $763.64, I believe, give or take a dollar or two. Uh, my CPPD is not that high because I did not work enough years for it to be that high. So I had to apply and that again will be addressed in a different video all together because it is another big huge slap in the face and a huge kerfuffle. Again, I've done a video about it, but I will do it again. We're not going to go there today. But if you want to stay eligible to keep having your benefits from social development, you have to do these things, which I am not mad about. You have to report when your income changes, when your assets changes, when your shelter expenses change, your living arrangements, the number or identity of persons in the unit, or you know, the normal place of residence. You have to let them know all these things when they change. And I'm okay with that being there because it's there in order to try to stop people from cheating the system. Do people still cheat the system? Of course, every single day. And people pay the price for it, you know. But don't be mad, okay? That's just how life works. It doesn't just happen in New Brunswick. It's a worldwide thing. So quickly in this document, they do have a little part where they explain what they consider what they take into consideration for someone who is going to have like the permanent visibility. Again, the whole kerfuffle of how this is dumb and they are actually lying, either, not here, but in the offices. That's in a whole other thing for a whole other day. We'll get there eventually. just says that to apply for permanent disability in the province of New Brunswick, you have to be on social assistance for at least two years. And during those two years, you have to be affected by some kind of medical condition that prevents you from working. The legislation is not that hard to understand. But again, when you get to the offices, it's a whole different story. And that will be a whole different thing. The second part is... You don't necessarily have to be on assistance for two years, but you have to have been suffering from it for more than two years. So these two kind of contradict each other, but that's the complication of legislation. They have to write things in that way to cover every single base of the if, ands, or buts. So now that we have a little bit of an idea of what a person has to go through and has to be in order to qualify to be permanently disabled, again, whether you guys think I fall under that qualification or not is not up for debate. Because yes, doctors have signed it and it has been accepted. Moving on. They're just saying here that in New Brunswick, because this is the act, this is not the welfare, you know, statistics I've been reading before. This is the act, 
which is saying that people are allowed to have GST, the you know child tax income benefit, and those are all the things that they are taking in consideration in the statistics as welfare because it's written here. Okay, and again, this is the hard part. This is the hard part. Persons with disabilities may also be eligible for assistance under the Portable Rent Supplement for Persons with Disabilities program. Qualifying individuals have their rent reduced to 30% of adjusted household income. That one is what we can call here as New Brunswick Housing. My apartment has finally been approved as New Brunswick Housing after being on the list for four years. Four years I've been waiting. Four years. And the last part, the New Brunswick Child Benefit is $20.83 per child per month. Now, again, I don't have kids, but my sister has two. I have a one-year-old niece and a four-year-old nephew. $20.83 per child per month? I think that gives them, like, one meal each a month. I think. I mean, I don't know how much stuff costs, but I do know that things are very expensive. And... Take that as your first slap in the face if you want to, because I do. So here we are with my favorite part of the law. I'm kidding. It's not my favorite part. This is the one that angers me, and this is going to be your second huge slap in the face. And not with a hand, with like the size of a phone book, okay? So when I showed this information to, again, family and friends from out west and they read this, their eyeballs fell out of their head. So this is the part of the legislation that we're reading for income to acts for items of basic need. So the minister shall grant assistance in the form of a basic needs allowance to meet the requirements of the unit for the following items of basic need. Basic need means things you need to live, to survive, in order to be able to not die. Food, clothing, household and personal items, fuel and utilities, routine transportation, and shelter. Makes complete sense so far, doesn't it? It does. So here it says subjects to the subsection 3, 4, and 5, which above just means the different categories of household types, you know. Single moms with kids, single person by themselves, you know, people that live with their, their elderly parents, whatever, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> says, if the actual cost to a unit for shelter is less than 25% of the amount of assistance, that may be provided to that unit under Section 17, which is later, you know, the amount, it says the amount, okay, the 586 or whatever. The unit shall be paid to that amount after deducting the difference between the 25% of that amount and the actual cost for shelter. So what it comes down to saying, and I know it sounds backwards if I say it this way, but this is what it means. If someone who is on assistance in any way, shape, or form so that means you might be working, but you're getting some kind of assistance. You know, it might be for a food supplement. It might be for, you know, it doesn't have to be for anything. Actually, you qualify for this no matter what. That's what the subsection 3, 4, and 5 meant. Also, if that your cost for your shelter, as in your rent or your mortgage payment or whatever the case may be, is more than 25% of the total amount of assistance that you could be getting, right, then they are going to give you the difference so that you don't pay more than 25%. You know, as long, you know, food, clothes, all these things, there's, there's extra amounts for food, clothing, and all that kind of whatnot. There's amounts, and they're, they're further down. I just don't have them because they hurt my feelings and they anger me. They will help you to make sure that you have enough food, enough clothing, enough fuel, enough stuff, and shelter if the amount that you pay for your shelter is 25% more than what you would be receiving if you qualified for income assistance. Unless, this is the slap in the face part. Subsection 2, right there, does not apply to a unit if the person in the unit is blind, deaf, or disabled. Yep, that's a slap in the face. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I happen to be someone who's on disability, therefore I don't qualify. That doesn't make any sense. That's exactly what I'm saying. So not only 
that I showed earlier with the graphs that in today's dollar, well, 2016's value of a dollar, someone who is employable and doesn't work for whatever reason the case may be, they actually make more money and it's going upwards compared to someone who is a single person on disability, we're stagnant, we're kind of staying in the same place or going down. And the person who is employable but doesn't work for whatever reason, they have access to all this. So if they're on assistance and their rent costs more than 25% of what their assistant is, they can get help. They get a supplement for food, they get a supplement for clothes, they get a supplement for all sorts of things. You don't get that supplement if you're disabled which are the people who need it the most. Because if you're employable, it means that you can work, and for a reason or another, you're not. If you're on disability, you can't work. Now, I know you all know that I used to have a part-time job. The most that I can make if I do have a part-time job is an extra $500 a month. That's the most I can do. If I go anything over that, it gets deducted penny by penny. And, but again, I got that part-time job taken away from me, from my psychiatrist, because working 11 hours a week was too hard on all the conditions that I have that make me be on disability. So what was I supposed to do? There was nothing for me to do. Nothing. I waited four years to get an apartment under the NV housing, and I'm not going to lie, I got it because my mom pulled some strings. I don't have to lie about that because I'm not lying to you guys about anything. Four years I waited and it, it's longer than that for most other people. And I mean, I would call and ask questions because I'm trying to do things on my own. And a lot of the times their answers were like, well, if you don't have any, you know, you don't have enough money, then ask a family member. I'm 36 years old. It's not my family's responsibility to support me anymore. That's been long time past. I was lucky that my mom was able to help me and did for the many years that she did. She isn't in the place where she can now. However, I don't want it either, but that's a different story for another day that has nothing to do with anything. Even if she wanted to right now, she can't. Who else am I? I mean, I'm 36. I'm, I don't need a parent to support me. That's the point of being an adult. They're supposed to help me with things. No, they don't care. I actually had someone at social development answer me with, well, can't you sell stuff from your house? So I'm not allowed to have a TV per se or eat, but people who can work, people, that's the thing. Everyone on dis with, that's, that's the lynch pin right there. Except people who are blind, deaf or on disability. The people who can't help themselves any more than they're already helping themselves are the ones that are getting less than everybody else, that don't qualify for the helping programs, that don't qualify for anything except for their disability pension check. If that doesn't anger you, then I don't know where your funny bone is in your body, but it ain't there. And again, to all those people out there that like to tell me that I, I'm on this for a free ride, heck no. This is not an easy life to live. I mean, First of all, being on the disability part isn't easy to live with in the first place. Whatever my diagnoses are, it's not up for debate. It's already been signed, sealed, and delivered three years ago. It's been done. I'm not going to explain it. But it does mean that somebody else out there, the ones that you're all mad at, that you think are screwing the system, who may or may not be, have better things, they have more money, they have access to more things than the people who can't help themselves do. I'm really sorry for that abrupt ending that my memory card was full and was kind of a good thing because I'm getting a little upset. So I've gone down a little bit and it brings me to the fact that I wanted to talk about Mr. Sinclair anyway. It just happened that his article came out a few days ago. So, yes, what I'm saying is that in the province of New Brunswick, the people who need help the most 
are purposely and legally excluded from the help that they give everybody else. And that's where Mr. Sinclair comes into place. Because I as well am sick and I as well have been turned around from an emergency room. So Mr. Sinclair was an Aboriginal person. He was a person though. He had brothers, he had parents, he was loved. He was a person. He wasn't anything less. And neither am I and neither are any of you or anybody else who is on disability. I think this is a problem here. So we're going to address things. So Mr. Sinclair went to the hospital in the emergency room. He had a note tucked in his pocket. Again, this article is actually linked on May No Holds Barred because it came up. Um, and he, you know, had a note in his little pocket from like another... Uh, health facility where they just weren't able to treat what he really needed. So he went to the emergency room and he gave the note and whatnot. And he happened to be a double amputee by then for medical reasons. And that's not actually important. That shouldn't matter. He was in a wheelchair and he got overlooked and he waited for his turn and waited for a turn for so long that he eventually died in his wheelchair in the emergency room. And he had been dead for long enough that when they found him, rigor mortis started to set in. So when someone passes away, you know, in the movies, they're all stiff. That does happen, but it doesn't happen immediately. It takes a little bit of time for that to happen. And by the time they found him, he was in that stage. He'd been dead for hours before they found him. And I'm scared that that's going to happen to me. I'm scared it's going to happen to other people. So again, I will link the story to Mr. Sinclair um, again at the bottom of this video, but it is also linked on my No Holds Barred page. Mostly, I mean, Aboriginal people, they have a special place in my heart. It's most probably part of my ancestry. I've never really done my lineage up on my biological father's side of the family, but there's probably some in there. But I do know that my stepdad is one of the only lineages in Kent County listening King County that can be traced back to have their um non-status Indian cards so my dad has it so does my sister they can trace that back so also my aunt who lives out west who's the one who you know let me know of, of this story they have adopted their son who's my cousin who I love very much and he you know is very special to everybody um he is an aboriginal little boy I mean it's not little anymore. He's in university doing great. But he is Aboriginal. And I've learned, I mean, that's how I was brought up maybe. I don't know. But the color of your skin and who your parents were back when or whatever should matter. We're all still people and we all matter. Whether you're disabled or Aboriginal or not, this person just happened to have all the trifecta of people that get ignored, which is heartbreaking. So this is a picture of me last year at Christmas. So this was not even a year ago. I've lost a lot of weight since then. Why? Because I was dying. My kidneys were not doing very well. My liver wasn't doing very well. And I got overlooked because of my medication lists tend to say that I am mentally ill. Now, thanks to the wonders of technology, and in metadata that does not lie. I can tell you that this all started on November 16th of 2017 when I finally went to the Georges Dumont Hospital and they realized all those things. So this is a series of all the stuff that I've been through then. So yeah, I was on IV treatments for more than one time. I had to go back like every couple days they would recheck my blood work. They would give me more things. I had to do this great little, I think it's called the barium swallow. I don't know what it was. It was really, really gross. Again, more IV treatments for the fun of it. That was, that was great. And this is my arm after all the blood tests and all the blood things that I've gotten. I, it's a running joke in the family. I mean, I get blood tests every six months because I have to for the medication that I'm on. 
And I mean, when I was a teenager, they could not hold me down enough to get blood out of me. Um, there's a long story to that that goes back to childhood trauma. But um, my veins are very deep in my arms that are hard to find. So the, so the running joke in the family is that I would make a horrible intravenous drug user. Which, thank baby Jesus, I'm not addicted to. But that's what my arm looked like after so many, you know, and that's just one arm, you know. They went to the other arm and they also went to my hand. I mean, that's what my hand looked like after so many, you know, intravenous IV fluid thingies that were going on in there. So here we go. Again, this was me last Christmas. And, you know, this is me today. So... I have lost a lot of weight. It was a side effect of the fact that I did have to change my diet. Um, so my kidneys weren't doing very well. My liver wasn't doing very well. A lot of my internal organs were shutting down and not working very well. And it was a combination of long-term medication use that I needed to have. Because when I was given it when I was 17, it was the only thing that would work. And again, the condition in my esophagus that made that, you know, I wasn't digesting things properly. Things were going through. So, yeah, I don't want to go back there. And um, it's quite scary. So the other day, I mean, my face swelled up. Half my face was swollen. So this was a picture of me in the ER after I'd been there for about six hours. When I walked in at 10 o'clock in the morning, because I knew it was going to be a long day, I told the nurse, like, what my condition was of esophagitis. esophagitis. She had no sweet idea what the heck it was. She wrote some weird, random thing. I knew she didn't understand it, so when the shift change came around 12, I went back in and talked to the triage nurse and told her what I really had. She didn't know what it was either. She made me Google it. Um, Whatever. And then she asked me about this ROA diagnosis that the first person put in there. And I was like, well, I don't know what that is, but I don't have it. It stayed there. And then things kept getting worse. Now, you can obviously tell from the picture that this side of my face is swollen compared to that side of my face. I mean, let's see if I can scooch in even closer. And by the afternoon, I was having a hard time seeing out of this eye. Now, this eye is the one that I'm legally blind in with glasses. So if I lose sight in this one, then I'm legally blind forever and I'm screwed. Don't want that happening. But I couldn't focus on that one. They didn't care. They didn't write that in there. So yeah, I got upset after waiting for a very long time. And I'm not blaming anybody, really. I understand that the nurses are overworked. They have way too many long hours, and that nurse that day was not having a good day. She took it out on me. But the fact of the matter is, is that the Georges Mont ER sent a person home that has known issues with internal organs failing in the past, home with a face half swollen, because I had had a panic attack by then. I mean, I'd been there forever. It was standing room only. And I was trying my best to not have, you know, more than the panic attack that I had. But the nurse was uncomfortable with the fact that people in the waiting room were actually listening to me when I was talking about the fact that I'd been there for about 10 hours and overlooked and whatnot. Um, and I had just kind of proven to her superior that her job wasn't necessarily done properly. I didn't say why. I, I didn't know why. I only figured out later that maybe she just overworked. But again, they sent me home. They had a security guard come down and everything. And if anybody questions anything, it happened that my sister was talking to me on the phone. I had my earbuds in with my mic and they thought maybe they was listening to music. I don't know, but she heard most of everything. Um, but they sent me home on the premise that, you know, since I was having a panic attack, I wasn't mentally okay. So I should go home. What? So they assumed I wasn't mentally okay because my medication list has medications for mental health reasons. But I'm just as sane as everybody else because I take my meds. However, they sent me home because they thought I wasn't mentally okay. That If someone isn't mentally okay, you give them an assessment and you keep them to make sure they don't go home and hurt themselves or hurt somebody else. But they sent me home. 
I could have had been something, and I still don't know if there's an internal organ thing going on. Because the blood test just happened last week. There's more ordered. I just haven't gotten down to get them done yet. I still don't know what's going on. And I'm scared shitless that my organs are failing again. And I have no way of knowing without getting blood tests done. And I waited for 10 hours. I mean, I was ready to wait. I brought snacks. I had colorings. I had both my cell phones, this one and my old one. I brought my chargers. I used my old one as an MP3 player. I was ready for the day. But no, they sent me home because she couldn't handle the pressure. And again, it's not necessarily her fault. It's a system-wide fault. But it still ends up that people who are disabled in the province of New Brunswick are at the losing end of everything. And we shouldn't be. We are people, again, like everybody else. We have parents. We have siblings. Some of us have children. Either way, we are a person that is loved and we matter to someone. Apparently, we don't matter to the government. But we matter to somebody else. And when one of us passes away, unfortunately, like Mr. Sinclair did, because we were overlooked, how are we going to... There's nothing to do with the whole language thingy, majiggy. We're not going to go into more details than that, but I mean, I don't care if you speak Spanish, okay? CPR is CPR, whatever language you speak. But I get the whole point of whatever. Um, but in all seriousness, yes, we need more mental health help. We need more addiction help so that people that are in a mental health crisis don't end up in the emergency room because they've got nowhere else to go. Because that's the problem for the most part, is that when somebody comes in that has a list with medication, with mental health, they are assuming that that person is there for mental health reasons and mental health crisis reasons, and they treat us all as such. So, like, we need more education, but we need more help for that the people that are in crisis don't end up in the ER, for the people that have legit reasons. Before I go, I'll leave you with one that will, again, leave you scratching your head. So two years ago, two, sorry, two, I was living at the old house. Um, it was very close to the Moncton City Hospital, so it was just cheaper to cab it there. I accidentally dropped the cover, the tank of the back part of the toilet on my foot. I mean, thought I broke my foot. <clears throat> Swollen, it was blue. And I went to the triage nurse, and the nurse asks me these questions. And she looks at my list of medication, and she's like, well, who's your psychiatrist? I told her who it was, and she said... Is he in the Dumont? My answer was like, yeah. And she looks at me and she says, why didn't you go there? And my answer was, because my foot's broken, not my head. And that's the moment that I clued in that when they look at my medication list, they automatically flag me as a psych case, no matter what the heck's going on with me. And I'm not the only one that gets that. And that needs to change. So a lot of things got said here. A lot of slaps in the face. And that is the tip of the iceberg. So hopefully you'll tune in for more. In a little bit, because I'm going to give you time to digest this. If you have any questions about anything that I just said, message me. I will share every link that I talk to. Again, all the graphs that I showed, they'll all be in the comment section on the No Holds Barred Facebook page. And any link, again, that I talked about here is linked in the bottom of the video. So with that, <clears throat> I thank you very much for your patience. I hope you're not too angry, but I hope you're angry enough that you stand up and want to do something. That you stand up with me and try to help change. Maybe not just, you know, not just for myself. I mean, I'm doing relatively okay. But there's other people out there who aren't. And they're the people that I'm trying to get them help. Open the system for everyone so that everybody has the chance that I had to get better. Thanks.